Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy during these uncertain times. My name is Carrie Grady Vincent and I'm the Senior Manager of Scientific and Clinical Programs here at Osteoporosis Canada. I have been a registered dietitian for over 30 years and having worked in many diverse roles. Today, I will be your moderator for today's webinar, Celiac Disease and Bone Health. Before we begin today's webinar, Osteoporosis Canada acknowledges the land that our offices located in Toronto are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Osteoporosis Canada is the only national organization serving people who have or are at risk for osteoporosis. The organization works to educate, empower, and support individuals and communities in the risk reduction and treatment of osteoporosis. At Osteoporosis Canada, we educate Canadians about bone health, including healthcare professionals and their clients. We are excited about today's presentation as we understand the challenge those with celiac disease can face. We are excited to be partnering with the Canadian Celiac Association for this webinar. We will be providing general information about bone health, osteoporosis and celiac disease. It is not our intention to provide individual advice and suggest for more information to talk to your family doctor or a registered dietitian. Before we get started, just a reminder that we will have time at the end of the webinar for questions. Please click the question and answer button on your screen to submit your questions, and we will try to get as many as we can time dependent. So without further delay, let's get started. It is my privilege and honor to introduce our speakers. Nicole Byram is the Health Promotions Manager for the Canadian Celiac Association. Nicole is also a registered dietitian who has worked for 17 years in both inpatient and outpatient settings. 10 years ago, her journey with celiac disease began with her mother being diagnosed at the age of 65. She realized at this time that celiac disease was going to be a very important part of her continuing education. Little did she know that a few years later, both her daughter and her husband would also be diagnosed with celiac disease. Nicole has seen and felt the impacts of diet changes and understands the struggles of those with celiac and is, and is committed to help those struggling with symptoms or a diagnosis to those newly diagnosed and to empower community members. So welcome, Nicole. Our other speaker is Shelly Hagen. Shelly is a registered dietitian too, and currently works as an educator in the Women's Wellness Program at the Grey Nuns Community Hospital in Edmonton, facilitating menopause and osteoporosis group education sessions and working one-on-one -on -one with patients to make well-informed health decisions concerning menopause and osteoporosis management. Shelly is credentialed as a NAMS certified menopause practitioner through the North American Menopause Society and is also a very active member of Osteoporosis Canada's Scientific Advisory Council. So without further ado, I would like to turn this, this over to our speakers. And Nicole, you're up first. Thank you so much. Just gonna get my fair screen on here and we'll get started. All right, well, thank you so much, Carrie, for that introduction. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. I'm excited to be collaborating with Osteoporosis Canada to present this information today. So again, I'm Nicole Byram, dietitian with the Canadian Celiac Association. And let's just get started here. So what is celiac disease? Celiac disease is a common disorder that is estimated to affect approximately 1% of the population. It is a, con a condition which the absorptive surfaces of the small intestine is damaged by a substance known as gluten. Gluten is a group of proteins present in wheat, barley, and rye, and their crossbred grains. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease and not 
a food allergy as many people may think. Some examples of food may contain gluten include common and more obvious food sources such as pasta, cereals, breads, baked goods, and crackers. Some less obvious sources where it can be a bit more hidden, sauces, soups, gravies, energy bars, soy sauce, and potato chips. The Canadian Celiac Association has an excellent document to help you navigate um, label reading and how to figure out if gluten is an issue with the food that you're looking at. On the link there that you can see on the screen, it teaches you how to read labels and how to discover whether the food is safe or not. In celiac disease, damage to the intestine can lead to a variety of symptoms and result in an inability of the body to absorb nutrients such as protein, fat, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals, all of these, of course, being necessary for good health. Symptoms for celiac disease come in two broad categories, classic or typical, and non-classic or atypical. Classic symptoms tend to be easier to diagnose because they're more obvious to the, to the person. These include chronic diarrhea, abdominal pain, malabsorption, and weight loss. More atypical symptoms include anemia, osteoporosis, extreme fatigue, oral ulcers, liver enzyme abnormalities, constipation, infertility, dental enamel defects, and neurological problems. Additionally, children can present with short stature, irritability, and vomiting. There's a skin condition known as dermatitis herpetiformis, which is known as celiac disease of the skin. Here, patients present with severely itchy and blistering rashes. The diagnosis can be confirmed with a skin biopsy and treatment consists of a strict gluten-free diet. For children with newly diagnosed celiac, the Canadian Celiac Association has lots of resources to help support you. The CCA has developed a 20 page and easy to read resource now available in French that's written especially for parents who have children with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. It contains information about the disease, tips for fellow parents, nutrition and other resources, recipes, and of course, gluten-free lunch and snack ideas. Included on this page also, which I found useful, was something you can print out for your, for your child's teacher or can give to camp instructors on what celiac disease is and what they need to look for when, when your child is in their care. So some great resources on our website. Celiac disease occurs commonly in patients with other autoimmune disorders. Because it is an autoimmune disorder itself, they do tend to, to come together. These other autoimmune disorders that could increase your risk would be thyroid disease or type 1 diabetes. Celiac can also run in families. As you can see in my own family, with my daughter, my mother, and my husband, it is definitely a genetically predisposed condition. We suggest screening high-risk individuals for celiac disease, even if symptoms are not clearly present. So if you have, for example, my daughter, who has celiac, I will screen my other, so I've got three children, I will screen my other two children because we, they have a first degree relative in their, in their dad and in their sister who has celiac. So my eldest daughter has been screened and my youngest is too young at the moment, but that her first set of blood work that she gets done, we will have her screened also, even if she's not showing any, any obvious symptoms of celiac disease. The risk for developing celiac disease, if you have a first degree relative, is higher than the general population. For those with a family member, it's closer to one in 10 of having celiac disease. It's important to note that we do not want family members starting a lifelong gluten-free diet if they do not have a proper diagnosis. How do you diagnose celiac disease? This is a commonly asked question in our Facebook group and email. It may have crossed your mind also. Diagnosis is not a one-step process, but rather consists of both blood work and an intestinal biopsy. The IgA tissue transglutaminase, or TTG antibody, is the current recommended test for screening celiac disease. Patients must be on a regular gluten-containing diet at the time of testing to make results valid. If your blood work comes back positive, then the definitive diagnosis is 
for celiac disease is made by a small intestinal biopsy. A biopsy is performed via endoscopy by a gastroenterologist. Again, it is important to note that gluten not be removed from the diet before the biopsy is completed, as this may impair the confirmation of diagnosis. The only treatment for celiac disease is a lifelong and strict gluten-free diet. At this time, there is no known medication that will cure celiac disease, and celiac disease will not go away over time. So you will, need to, you will need to avoid all sources of gluten, including cross-contamination and cross-contact with other gluten-containing items. So what is cross-contamination? Examples of this may be you go to a restaurant and you order French fries. Those French fries may be deep fried in the same oil as say chicken nuggets or um, battered uh, fish. The gluten particles in that oil could beyond the food that you are eating. And so therefore those French fries are no longer gluten-free. They have been um, exposed to gluten and are not considered safe for someone with celiac disease. Celiac disease is one of the causes of osteoporosis. In untreated celiac disease, the intestinal lining is damaged. And as mentioned earlier, you will not absorb your nutrients properly leading to deficiencies. With regards to osteoporosis, Untreated celiac may affect the absorption of nutrients, including calcium and vitamin D. Celiac disease is associated also with the release of inflammatory cytokines or proteins, which increase the rate of bone loss and may negatively affect bone formation. Some quick facts. In Canada, it is estimated that about 1% of the population is affected by celiac disease, although it is estimated that about 90% of celiac disease goes undiagnosed. This is because we mentioned the typical versus atypical symptoms. A lot of the atypical symptoms aren't generally tested. So we need to start bringing more awareness to when to test for celiac disease. Delayed diagnosis of celiac disease increases the individual's risk for development of serious chronic medical issues. Those include, as mentioned, osteoporosis, infertility, malabsorption, tooth enamel defects, central and peripheral nervous system disease, pancreatic disease, and an increase in certain types of cancer, including intestinal lymphoma. In newly diagnosed, oh, excuse me, the, the term non-celiac gluten sensitivity is used to describe the clinical state of individuals who develop symptoms when they consume gluten containing foods and feel better on a gluten-free diet but these people do not have celiac disease. Unlike celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity have no biomarkers to test for. So there is no current blood test that can be taken for diagnosis. All antibodies are absent, unlike in celiac disease. And additionally, as you saw in the second slide with the image of the villus atrophy that is present in those with untreated or newly diagnosed celiac disease, villus atrophy is not present in non-celiac gluten sensitivity. The treatment for non-celiac gluten sensitivity is the same as the treatment for celiac disease, a strict gluten-free diet. So although they present very differently, the treatment is the same. I'm gonna pass over now to Shelly and we can talk a little bit about uh, nutrition. Thanks, Shelly. Hello, just let me get set up here and So thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you for that great um, setup, uh, Nicole. So I'm going to focus more on the osteoporosis uh, side of the story. And first of all, we'll just do a quick sort of definition of what osteoporosis is. So um, most people are aware that osteoporosis is a, a, a disease of the skeleton whereby changes take place deep inside of the skeleton and you often have no signs or symptoms until you end up with a, with a broken bone or a fracture. So on your screen, you can see, um, this is looking at bone under the microscope. And on the left-hand side, you can see what the structure of healthy bone looks like versus a bone that has been affected by osteoporosis. And so if we sort of think about what's happening then in the healthy bone versus bone with osteoporotic, 
what um, there's sort of two principles that are operating. So not only can you see that in people who develop osteoporosis, they have a lot less bone. The bone is normally filled with holes. It has kind of a honeycomb structure, but those holes get larger when you have osteoporosis. And most people understand that. They understand that there's less bone, but what many people don't realize is the bone that is left behind is much poorer quality bone. So you can start to see in the bone that has osteoporosis, those little supporting struts that are in between the holes in the bone, those struts start to thin or disappear or become um, quite weak. And it's really those two things operating together. The fact that you have less bone and poor quality bone that really increase your risk for fracture or breaking bones going forward. So osteoporosis, what we're all so concerned about is really figuring out um, who is at risk for, for breaking bones and uh, trying to predict that and prevent that from happening. And it is estimated that about 80% of all fractures that occur in individuals over age 50 are likely due to osteoporosis. And the fractures that we're particularly worried about when it comes to osteoporosis are fractures that happen for with due to minimal force or minimal trauma hitting the skeleton. So they're called fragility fractures. So all of us, if we're in a car accident or we fall off a ladder and there's this huge force applied to the skeleton, it's reasonable to expect that you might end up with a broken bone. It's not fun, it's not exciting, but you know, that's a huge force. And so bone breaks. But what we're more concerned about with osteoporosis is what we call fragility fractures. And that's fractures that happen from doing everyday activities. Say that you're walking on a sidewalk and, and trip over a tiny crack, or you're getting into your car and slip and um, end up with a broken bone, or you're walking down your stairs and you slip on the bottom stair and end up with a wrist fracture. So when a person develops a fracture from a standing or a sitting position, sort of doing everyday activities, there was, if we think about it, there was really only minimal trauma applied to the skeleton and you ended up with a broken bone. So that's not a typical scenario. And most of the time, the underlying cause of that fracture wasn't the fall per se, but it was osteoporosis and that weak bone structure. And why we're so worried about these scenarios is if you've had one fracture, it really increases your chance of, of more fractures down the road. So we, we don't wanna get into this cycle of just treating fractures over and over. So when you have osteoporosis, um, almost all the bones in the body can be affected, but certainly we do see some sites that are more likely to be affected by osteoporosis uh, than others. And so the, we often start off with wrist fractures or fractures of the upper uh, arm and shoulder. And that kind of makes sense. When you go to fall, you're sort of protecting yourself. And so then you end up um, fracturing bones in those regions. As we get older, we often see tiny little fractures developing in the mid and lower, lower back. So those are often referred to as spinal fractures, compression fractures, wedge fractures, they have a whole variety of names, but it's all sort of the same process, also called vertebral fractures. And then as we move into our 70s, we often um, encounter hip fractures, which is a fairly significant fracture to have to deal with and requires surgery and, and uh, is a bit complicated to sort out. And we estimate about 90% of all hip fractures are due to osteoporosis. So as you can see, this um, bone issue can have very serious outcomes. And so, um, you know, it's important to be aware of it and sort of be on top of it. So there are a variety of risk factors that have been identified that can signal um, or uh, that are related to the increased risk for osteoporosis. And Osteoporosis Canada has a great interactive tool um, that you can um, do a risk factor assessment for yourself and sort of evaluate your, your personal risk. Or there are other tools that we use in the medical community. And one really super healthy, helpful tool is something called the FRAX tool. And that stands for Fracture Risk Assessment Tool. And you can access this tool through the Osteoporosis Canada website or just 
simply by Googling FRAX. And this is a, a research-based tool that is very helpful and it's um, very reliable in helping us to predict who do we think is likely to break a bone due to osteoporosis sort of over the next 10 years. So it's a simple questionnaire that you fill in. And, it, and again, it's trying to look at some of the, the risk factors associated with bone loss. So we know that as you get older, you have increased risk for osteoporosis. Women are more at risk than men. We also look at your, your weight and your height. And then some questions about, have you already had a, a fragility fracture? What's the family history like in terms of hip fractures? Have you ever had to take certain medications like blue um, steroid, oral steroids to maybe treat other health issues like Crohn's disease? Do you have rheumatoid arthritis? And then question 10 is looking at secondary osteoporosis. And this is where the celiac disease uh, fits in. So um, secondary osteoporosis is defined as um, other medical issues or health issues that increase your risk of losing bone. And so celiac disease, as Nicole mentioned, affects uh, when it's undiagnosed and the gut isn't working well, it can affect the absorption of several key nutrients that affect bone health. So if you had celiac disease, you would check off um, yes to that question. And then looking at your alcohol uh, intake. And then the last question is asking you about if you've had a bone density test to, re to um, take note of one of the scores. But this tool is still works even without the bone density information. So you can see in this questionnaire, I kind of populated it with the information of a 58 year old. And then when you put in the information and push calculate, you can see that it, um, it calculated her, her 10 year fracture risk at 5.5%. And that's relatively low. If it sort of works out, it's under 10% then that's reassuring and you're considered to be quite low risk. In the next slide, I've presented the same information, but I've changed it so that this person has celiac disease. So I've checked off yes to, this, to the secondary osteoporosis. And then you can see that the risk for osteoporosis, the risk for fracture going forward increases a little bit to about 7.4%, but, um, it's still under the 10%, so it's still reassuring. Um, generally, we don't look at sort of starting osteoporosis um, treatment until that risk approaches 20% or higher. So you can see these tools are helpful for sort of assessing your risk and then just to sort of helping you account in terms of the, the uh, celiac disease as well. So um, in terms of sort of thinking about celiac disease, we know that um, individuals who have celiac disease, 38 to 72% of them also have osteoporosis or low bone mass, and that the risk of osteoporosis is higher if we're, they're diagnosed with celiac disease as they get older, if they are underweight or have low body mass, and also if they're diagnosed more years after their last menstrual period or after their menopause. And so not only are we wanting to know who has a low bone density, but again, the important thing is uh, what's the fracture risk? And the research is showing that the, the risk of fractures of people in celiac disease is higher, twofold, twice as high as, as individuals in the general population. Um, but the good news is that the risk decreases if we diagnose the celiac disease and you follow the strict gluten-free diet and the gut reheals and you start absorbing nutrients, um, that can really reverse your risk of uh, um, osteoporosis and its complications going forward. And the other thing is, it's also important, there's a little bit of a two-way connection here because not only is celiac disease a concern for people with osteoporosis, but we also know that um, for people who have osteoporosis are more likely to be diagnosed with celiac disease. So we need to sort of think of, of um, these connections both ways. So looking at osteoporosis in people with celiac disease, but also looking at celiac disease in people with osteoporosis. And in our osteoporosis clinic, we often um, do the screening work for celiac disease when we're 
first working with patients if they haven't been tested in the last three years. And it is surprising how much uh, celiac disease we do pick up. Um, and so uh, Nicole has already outlined exactly how um, celiac disease affects the skeleton. So I'm not gonna go through that. Um, I did want to briefly mention a survey that was done a few years ago involving members of the Ottawa Celiac uh, Association, and um, there was some fairly reassuring news here that did show that a high percentage of the members had had bone density tests. Uh, um, not so good news that 44% had already had a previous fracture. Um, so there is a bit of awareness then and sort of starting to connect a celiac disease with osteoporosis and, and picking it up and doing some screening. But what I was sort of alarmed about, and I hope this has changed in the intervening years, is when we looked at sort of the preventative steps, um, there weren't a lot of action, state, action steps taken that people were increasing their calcium and uh, getting the right amount of vitamin D and things like that. So that's really where I want to go next and sort of walk you through sort of the uh, recommendations in terms of a bone healthy lifestyle. So first of all, if you have celiac disease, you really need to follow a strict gluten free diet. And that's where um, the celiac Dis association and people like Nicole can really give a lot of guidance with regards to that. We also, all of us, need to pay attention to adequate calcium and vitamin D, limiting caffeine, sodium, and alcohol, because those can have um, negative effects on bone health if, it's, if it's consumed in large quantities. And we don't have a ton of time to walk through all that today. If you smoke, stop smoking, try to be as active as possible, and then maintain good balance with the goal of avoiding falls. Lots of times I'm asked, if I have osteoporosis, do I need to follow a, a gluten-free diet? Is that helpful for my bones? And the answer is no. The, the strict gluten-free diet is just really nece necessary for people who have been diagnosed with celiac disease. It doesn't offer any benefits outside of that group and it, it doesn't improve bone health um, in other ways. So let's talk a little bit more about calcium. And again, just a basic primer on calcium. Calcium is an extremely important um, mineral. Most of the calcium in your body is stored in your bones and your, your teeth, so in your skeleton. But there is calcium found in every living cell in the body, and it does some really important uh, processes like helping to uh, your blood to clot properly, help to relay nerve impulses, help to maintain normal pH levels. So the body very tightly regulates the calcium environment in the body because it has to protect these really critical processes. And so the way that it, it thinks about that is if you have enough calcium coming into your body on a daily basis, then everything works in balance and you know everything's on track. But if you don't meet your daily calcium requirements, the body says, ooh, I need this amount of calcium to do all these important jobs. What's my backup plan? And the backup plan is to withdraw calcium from your skeleton to keep everything working nicely. And yes, you do have a lot of calcium accumulated in your skeleton, but imagine if you are withdrawing a certain amount every day over the course of months to years, those bones become very depleted and very thin. And, um, and we don't wanna see that um, as we get older. So how much calcium do we need to keep this all in balance? Well, to a certain extent, it, it, it depends on your age group. So see where you are, but generally for men and women over age 50, we're looking at uh, needing 1200 milligrams of calcium per day. And so an important concept to understand is this 1200 milligrams a day represents sort of the amount that you get from your diet on a regular basis. In addition to any supplements, we'll add, we add those two numbers together and the total amount of calcium is 1200 milligrams per day. There's no point in getting more than that. 
So we, um, we always start by sort of getting a sense of how much calcium do you get from the, the typical foods that you eat on a daily basis. And so here's a list of the calcium content of uh, various food products. Uh, you, you do tend to have a bit of a jump start if you like dairy, but there are other sources and there's a whole proliferation of sort of non-dairy uh, fortified beverages based on soy and um, almond and, and things like that, that have calcium and vitamin D added to them. So it, it is possible to um, try to meet your needs with diet wherever possible. Um, and uh, other foods like dark green leafy vegetables, nuts, seeds also, also pr provide small amounts of calcium. And you can buy certain brands of orange juice that are fortified with calcium as well. And um, you know those are great, op great uh, food sources. And fish, if you eat the bones, is also a, a good calcium source. And again, there's lots of tools that you can find that list the calcium content of foods. And Osteoporosis Canada has an, a great in interactive tool um, called the Calcium Calculator that will help you calculate sort of the amount of calcium that you get from your diet on a regular basis. And then don't forget to read your labels and, and look at um, the information on the nutrition facts table. And so always look at the uh, serving size. So in, in this case, if you were to eat three quarters of a cup of yogurt or sort of 175 grams, it would give you 25% of the daily recommended value of calcium for the day. And so I often get questions, oh, you know, is 25%, but you've recommended X number of milligrams. So there is a, a neat little trick that you can do to convert that percent daily value into milligrams. And you can only do this for calcium. You can't do it for any other nutrient. But basically, if you put a zero behind that 25%, so 25% is roughly equivalent to 250 milligrams of calcium if you were to eat that three quarters of a cup. Uh, portion. So that may help you out with your nutrition label reading and help uh, sort of get a sense of how much calcium you're getting from your diet. And again, it's always best to try to get the calcium from food wherever possible. And there's lots of little creative ways and tips of doing that. So what we do is we always get a sense then of how much calcium you get from your diet. And if you're like most North Americans, our diets give us about 600 milligrams a day which isn't meeting the daily recommendation of 1200. So then many people have turned to a supplement because they just can't get enough calcium from their food because either they don't like these foods or maybe they have some lactose intolerance or other reasons. And so again, we want to plan so that the combination of diet and any supplements equal the 1200 without sort of going over that mark. So people go shopping for calcium supplements. There's all these different kinds out there. Some are super expensive, some less expensive. And people ask me all the time, well, how do I choose which one? And so it's important to remember that when you're looking at the label of a calcium supplement, it's not pure calcium, it's calcium joined to something else. And that's called a calcium salt. So of the weight of the product, you need to figure out how much is the, the calcium portion. And so the, the information on the label that tells you that is the information that lists the elemental or the usable calcium content. And so that the elemental portion in a supplement can vary quite, can vary quite a lot from as, as low as 60 milligrams to 650 milligrams per day or 60, 650 milligrams per portion. So you really need to read the labels carefully and understand how much is elemental calcium because that's the number that you will use to determine the right dose. And so if you pick a product that gives you, you know, 500 milligrams of elemental calcium carbonate and your diet gives you 600 to 700 milligrams of calcium a day, you put the two together, they add up to 1100 to 1200, you're on track. Um, and you can go from there. In terms of calcium supplements, we recommend choosing a calcium supplement that has an NPN number, which stands for natural product number. And that lets you know that that 
that tablet will indeed um, break apart and, and be available for absorption. And there's it, it's also a measure of some quality um, control that the product has been checked and it's free of lead and, and other contaminants. We do not recommend calcium supplements made from bone meal or dolomite. A few tips if you do have to take a calcium supplement and you just can't meet your requirements with food is generally it's best to take your calcium supplement with food. If you do have to end up taking more than one calcium supplement a day that you should take it in divided doses and to take calcium with lots of water. Some people find it a bit constipating. And again, remember at the end of the day, your goal is 1200 milligrams considering all sources. There's no benefit to you know, upping your diet and then still taking another thousand by supplement. And uh, the, the market has responded. So there are lots of other options. If you find it difficult to swallow calcium pills, you, there's all other forms that are available. But again, you have to use the same critical eye and read the labels carefully and evaluate uh, for elemental calcium content. And there are extras in calcium supplements, but they don't necessarily offer any extra benefit and they certainly can add to the cost. You do need vitamin D to help absorb calcium, but you don't have to take it right at the same time. So let's move on and talk a little bit about vitamin D because it's really critical for a skeleton. It's, it's very important vitamin for other body functions as well, but um, we're just gonna focus on the, the bone um, elements today and adequate vitamin D increases calcium absorption significantly. And again, you'll find different recommendations out there for the amount of vitamin D. These are the, the recommendations from Osteoporosis Canada. So again, find your age group. And uh, if we think about where vitamin D comes from, it's the sunshine vitamin. Um, and we, we make vitamin D when a certain, uh, when sun UV light hits the, the uh, skin, it activates some um, changes in the body that e eventually can lead to vitamin D being activated in the liver and the kidney. Unfortunately, it has to be a specific type of sun and the winter sun doesn't cause this reaction in our skin um, because we live so far north. And in the summer, it's usually the sun between 10 and 2, which we're often told to avoid to lower our risk for skin cancer. And we also are, use sunscreen, which is fantastic to reduce the risk for skin cancer, but sunscreen blocks the vitamin D synthesis in our skin to a large extent. So you can start to get a sense then that it may be difficult to meet your vitamin D requirements from sun. And so that was part of the reason why many, many years ago, Health Canada decided to fortify milk with vitamin D to make sure we got sources of it. So a glass of milk and the non-dairy beverages give you about 100 international units of vitamin D per 250 mils. Fish, especially cold water fish, is also a good source of vitamin D. So if you are consistently eating uh, fish products two to three times a week, then you can it, you often have a jump start on vitamin D. But when you look at the list of foods here in front of you, you can see it is a fairly short list. And so for many of us, these aren't our favorite foods or we don't eat them often enough. And so it, it can be a challenge to get uh, or almost impossible to get enough vitamin D from food. And so really that um, leaves us with the the fact that most adults really need to consider taking a vitamin D supplement, um, especially over adults over the age of 50. And so again, read your labels. Um, there's usually about 400 international units of vitamin D and multivitamin products. You can buy vitamin D separately on its own and it comes in different strengths. And generally we uh, recommend choosing vitamin D supplements um, in the form of vitamin D3, uh, it's just slightly more potent than some of the other varieties out there. So can you get too much vitamin D? Well, it's really impossible from the sunlight because the, the body shuts it off. It's very unlikely from food, but you do have to monitor your supplements. And these days I do have people, patients coming into the osteoporosis clinic that are on very high doses of vitamin D that they're taking for other reasons. And vitamin D is fat soluble. So you have to sort of monitor all the sources. And remember, you can get into trouble if you're taking vitamin D and it's with your calcium, it's in your multivitamin, 
and you're taking a separate supplement, all of a sudden those numbers can add up pretty quickly. So the last thing I just want to mention a little bit that's really important in terms of um, uh, nutrition and bone health is to make sure that you're getting adequate protein. I see lots of people in the osteoporosis clinic who have sort of um, got away from regular meals or, or cooking and are, are living quite simply with tea and toast or, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of um, peanut, toast and peanut butter, but they're just not getting adequate protein. And a healthy skeleton needs adequate amounts of protein. So for most of us, that means sort of getting about, um, you know, 45 to 65 grams of protein a day. So you can read your labels, that nutrition facts table, and sort of do a little bit of, of calculations to make sure you're in that health in getting that amount of protein per day. And there is quite a bit of debate in the literature right now if perhaps we should actually be recommending a little bit more protein, especially as we get older, um, partly to um, ensure good skeletal health going forward. So to recap then, all of us need to pay attention to making sure we're getting adequate calcium, vitamin D and protein, make sure with, where we are within a healthy weight range, limited caffeine, alcohol, and sodium, stop smoking and being active. And if you are someone that has been diagnosed with celiac disease, then you also need to add to that list to follow a strict gluten-free diet forever to keep that gut nice, nice and healthy so you can absorb all these nutrients. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Nicole. Thanks so much, Shelly. That was excellent. Very informative. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen here. Can everybody see my screen again? Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through this quickly for sake of time. So we have questions, time for questions. I wanted to discuss a little bit about when you're newly diagnosed um, or undiagnosed with celiac disease, often you have a trouble, you have trouble digesting um, lactose. So in newly diagnosed and untreated, the lining of the small intestine is damaged by the ingestion of gluten and therefore lactose intolerance is very common. When following a strict gluten-free diet, the gut is able to heal, making lactose intolerance temporary in most, most people with celiac disease. So this is a condition that will often affect people at the beginning, but then over time, once your TTG has sort of returned to normal, then you will be able to reintroduce um, introduce dairy again or other sources of, of lactose. Um, we know that dairy products are one of Canada's leading sources of calcium. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at how people can ensure that they're getting enough calcium if they are in fact having an issue with lactose intolerance. Um, some people may be able to tolerate small amounts or lower amounts of lactose when they're first diagnosed. For example, lactose-reduced milk may be tolerated, um, but there are lactose-free options available too. And yogurt and hard cheeses are lower in the lactose ladder. So those also might be tolerated by people when they're with celiac disease when they're first diagnosed and having issues with lactose. Of course, there are lactose-free sources as well, um, including, and I know that um, Shelley went through some of these too, fortified orange juice, uh, almonds, canned salmon with bones, uh, fortified soy, rice, uh, beverages, uh, soybeans, instant oatmeal are all calcium sources. Osteoporosis Canada, as Shelley mentioned, also has some great links to foods high in calcium and you can take a look at that. So there's a lot of resources there. Um, for us, if you're wondering if you might have celiac disease, here are some helpful links from our uh, Canadian Celiac Association website that you might find useful. The CCA website, um, which you can find at www.celiac.ca, is loaded with useful and evidence-based information that will help you at each stage of your journey. So whether you're contemplating whether you may or may not have celiac disease and how you go about getting tested, um, if you're a newcomer who's newly been diagnosed with celiac disease and you're wondering how do you discover if there's gluten in something, learning about label reading, and for our masters among us who have had celiac disease for many years, uh, how do we learn? This is a great example of a, of a sort of a masterclass for our celiac population, 
learning the next steps. Now, how do I protect my bones? Now that I know the diet and now that I know how to, I have been diagnosed. I know how to read labels. I know what's safe for me to eat. Now what's my next steps? How can I ensure that my bone health is protected moving forward? Well, I've written up a few myths and facts that are very common and I get, I get asked a lot. So I thought it'd be interesting to read some out to you guys. So myth, celiac disease is easily recognized. So fa the fact is celiac disease can be difficult to recognize since symptoms are often vague and nonspecific. Symptoms can vary greatly from person to person and can appear at any age. Myth, celiac disease is a common childhood disease. Fact, celiac disease is an inherited condition, as we mentioned before, and symptoms may develop at any age after the ingestion of gluten. So you don't have to be a child to be diagnosed with this disease. You can be at, you can be any age. As I mentioned, my mom was 65, my daughter was five, and my husband was 43 when he was diagnosed. So this can happen at any stage of life. And my family can attest to that out of personal experience. In my years of working in long-term care, I also saw people in their 80s and 90s be tested and diagnosed with celiac disease. So it's certainly something that can happen at any time. Myth, celiac disease can be outgrown. The fact is celiac disease is a lifelong disease. Eating food containing gluten will continue to damage the intestinal lining and will increase the risk of developing associated conditions and other complications. The only known treatment for celiac disease is a gluten-free diet for life. Lastly, myth, a person with celiac disease can tolerate a small amount of dietary gluten once in a while. So I get asked this question, I go to a birthday party, can't I just have a small piece of cake? Well, the fact is, even though some people with celiac disease may seem to tolerate gluten, damage is still being done to the intestinal lining when gluten is eaten, and the treatment for celiac is a strict gluten-free diet. So no, unfortunately, a small amount of gluten will still cause damage. So it is, it is unfortunately um, something you have to be stick to all the time. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Here's our Canadian Celiac Association um, contact information. If anybody has any questions specifically about celiac disease, uh, you are more than welcome to email info at celiac.ca or give us a call on our toll-free number here or visit our website. Um, I work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, and my counterpart counterpart Kaylee works on Fridays. So we are happy to answer any questions you might have by, by email or phone call. So please do connect with us if you have any questions or take a look at our website. There are loads of, um, you know, in parts of information you can take a look at there to help you really discover um, any answers to questions that you may have. So Carrie, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Thank you so much everybody for listening and I look forward to the questions. Okay, thank you so much Shelley and Nicole. That was really informative. I just wanted to let everyone know at this point that this webinar will be recorded and it will be available on our OC replay webpage in the next 24 to 48 hours. So for those of you asking if it will be recorded, yes, it will be. So now we will turn to our uh, question and answer period. We do have a, a few minutes. So I'm going to start with a question for Nicole. Um, Nicole, if a food product comes from another country, is it safe to eat in Canada? Um, does it meet our Canadian labeling requirements? So this is a great question and it's one that we get asked quite frequently and thankfully in Canada, Health Canada has made it a requirement that any food regardless of where it comes from, has to comply with Health Canada regulations. So you'll notice on some foods, it has a sticker on top of a current ingredients list, for example. And that means that Health Canada has ensured that it is listing all um, sources of gluten. So in our labeling requirements in Canada, gluten or any gluten containing items has to be listed in the ingredients list, in the may contains list or the contains statement. So if there is um, any gluten in that, lab in that 
food item, regardless of the source or where it has come from, if it's come from the States, if it's come from, from overseas, it doesn't matter. It will have to disclose if there's gluten in that item. So yes, it will always be safe. And if something is labeled gluten-free in Canada, it has been tested to be less than 20 parts per million of gluten and safe for people who have celiac disease. Okay, thank you. Um, question for Shelly. Shelly, um, I know you get this question a lot, but I think it's important to ask it again. Is it okay to take one calcium citrate pill a day? Well, again, we always start with your diet. So if, if your diet was not meeting the daily requirements of either 1,000 or 1,200 milligrams based on your age group, and there was no way that you felt that you could modify your diet to meet your daily requirements, then you could add in a, a calcium supplement. And as I mentioned, there's lots of varieties out there. There are minor differences in, in the way the various calcium um, supplements are absorbed. But the bottom line is you have to find a supplement that, that you tolerate well and works for your body. So calcium citrate is an option. But again, you would just be evaluating the elemental content. And, um, and then um, most of the time you get about 300 milligrams of elemental calcium in a calcium citrate supplement. So if your diet was giving you 700 milligrams and you couldn't get it up to the thousand and you added in one calcium citrate supplement per day, um, that would take you to the combination of the diet plus that one supplement then would take you to the, the thousand milligrams. And some people tolerate some types of calcium supplements better than others, but that's a bit of trial and error and see sort of how your body does. The only time that we get super um, prescriptive and say you if you need a calcium supplement it should be this specific calcium supplement is if you're someone that that takes certain medications um, that reduce stomach acid that are known as proton pump inhibitors and common names are things like uh, tecta or nexium or um, um, pantalac if you take a medicine like that every day it reduces the acid in your stomach and therefore you won't absorb all types of calcium supplements equally. And so if, if you're on those medications and using regularly and you do need a calcium supplement because you can't get your diet up, then it should be in the form of calcium citrate. Okay. Thanks, Jelly. I, I did want to point out to our attendants that osteoporosis does have a calcium calculator on our website. If you uh, want to calculate how much calcium you're getting in your diet, please, please look at our website for that tool. Um, Nicole, another question for you. Is malabsorption a factor and how can it be tested? Yeah, so as I mentioned in my, um, my presentation, the, in untreated or newly diagnosed celiac disease, malabsorption is definitely a factor. When you think back to that image of the villus atrophy, I like to think of it as like, um, if you think of a shag carpet, you know, all of the, the villi, these are the absorptive sur surfaces. So all your nutrients are absorbed in these surfaces. When you have undiagnosed celiac disease or at the beginning when you have newly diagnosed celiac disease, your, your intestinal system is, is much more dulled down and the absorptive, the absorptive surfaces are not there. So you think of kind of like a water slide where things are just kind of going through. So, the absor so malabsorption is a big issue, which is why osteoporosis um, is a secondary, is a, a secondary osteoporosis is a factor with celiac disease because you're not absorbing your nutrients. As time goes on, when you're diagnosed and when you go on a strict gluten-free diet, and quite often we have to kind of troubleshoot with people if their TTG is not coming down to the appropriate level. So that is the level that we test with people with celiac disease to see, to see where they are at. Um, if the levels aren't coming down, we often have to troubleshoot with people where they may be getting hidden or, or um, sort of cross-contamination sources of gluten. So malabsorption is a big issue, but over time, as your TTG goes down and your, and your guts heal and your villi are all standing up again, you will be able to absorb things again and that malabsorption will, will decrease and be at um, the regular level as everybody else is. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Uh, one more for you, Shelley. If a person is diagnosed with celiac disease and is following a strict diet when they fracture, do we still select yes for secondary causes with fracs? Yes, absolutely. Because you, you always have celiac disease as, 
Nicole mentioned, the, um, it's always there. The, the treatment is a strict gluten-free diet forever. Okay. So it, it, you, would have, you wouldn't be getting the same sort of effects on this negative effects on the skeleton if you have been following the strict gluten-free diet, but I still would, would put it as a secondary source. Okay. Um, we do have a link to Frax on our website if anyone is interested. Um, one more question for Nicole and one more for Shelley, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, Nicole, what supplements and blood work are recommended for somebody diagnosed with celiac disease? I know you covered it, but I think it's great to uh, yeah. remind folks. Yeah, so that's a, a definitely an important question. So so as mentioned before, the initial blood work, so if you suspect that you might have celiac disease or you have a first or second degree relative with diagnosed celiac disease, we suggest you go to your doctor and get um, and request an IgA TTG blood test. That test will give us um, a very good indication as to whether or not you, you um, may have celiac disease. So depending on what number that is, assuming that it is celiac disease, so that's the first step. Um, quite often along with that blood work, you might also get your iron levels tested. People with um, celiac disease will often present also with iron deficiency anemia or with low vitamin D levels. So those are the most commonly supplemented uh, nutrients when somebody is newly diagnosed um, because they're often anemic because again, previously discussing that malabsorption, they're not absorbing their iron appropriately. So we'll have to, at first, what is also often a good idea is in that blood panel, we'll you know, look at your hemoglobin, look at your iron, look at your, we can look at your B12 levels if your doctor can um, request a vitamin D. And then um, I know in my daughter, when she was first diagnosed, she was vitamin D and iron deficient as well. So those were the two things that we were mainly supplementing at the beginning. And I actually continue to supplement um, her with iron because her um, levels are a little more sticky at the moment. So those are the big, those are the big ones. The initial blood work, if that comes back positive, we would then go on to a biopsy. And then keeping, of course, on the, the gluten containing diet while you're getting both of those done. Because if you go on a gluten free diet before that blood work, then we could get a false negative. As well as if you go on a gluten free diet after you get your TTG number back before your biopsy, which can sometimes, especially right now, be quite a delay because of. Um, you know, my daughter waited a couple of months, my husband waited about a month, but now with COVID, I'm hearing of people having to wait, you know, six months plus for their biopsy. So if you're in a lot of distress with your, uh, with your symptoms, you can go on a gluten-free diet and then you have to do a gluten challenge. So it can be very, it can be very uh, uh, tricky time if you're being told to wait six months to a year. Uh, we have to counsel you through going on a gluten-free diet and then reintroducing gluten for a period of time before your test, because you have to have gluten in your system for both the blood work and the biopsy to show up positive. So it's really important uh, to note that gluten has to be in your system for both of those things. Supplements for after depends on what you could be deficient in before. So we're not going to just start supplementing um, haphazardly. We want to make sure we supplement methodically and appropriately. Um, so knowing if you have an anemia, knowing if you have any, you know, um, any deficiencies that we need to target is where we're going to go. So I knew with my daughter, we needed to target vitamin D and iron. Um, those are typical ones that we do target. So, um, you know, that's where we would, that's sort of where we would start. I hope that answers that question. That's great. Thank you. Our last question I'm going to direct to Shelley. Um, can you explain what you meant by divided doses of calcium? Um, so uh, just like if we're um, eating diet, eating uh, calcium rich foods, we tend to not eat them all at once, but we sort of distribute them at major meals and snacks throughout the day. And so the same thing, if you end up having to take more than one calcium supplement per day, um, you know, your dietary calcium is really quite low. And the only way that you can meet the recommended intake is by taking two calcium supplements. Um, it's best to take those calcium supplements 
at separate times, not together. We're not the best calcium absorbers and absorbers at the best of times. And if we take a whole bunch of calcium at once, we're even less efficient at absorbing it. And so again, it just sort of all points back that if you can get your, your calcium from food, it's usually easier because we are tending to eat at, throughout the day. And when you know, you're talking about mel- multiple supplements and sort of fitting them in and sort of organizing all that, it can be a bit of a challenge. So um, again, if you have to take two supplements, take them at separate times, generally with meals. Um, and, and if possible, always try to find ways to increase dietary sources if possible. Okay. Well, um, I want to say thank you again to both of our experts, Nicole and Shelley for such an informative presentation on celiac disease and bone health. Um, The slide that's just popped up now um, provides you with more information from um, Osteoporosis Canada, including our our calcium calculator, our our podcasts, OC replay, where you will be able to find this webinar, I think probably tomorrow or the day after. Um, And um, I also want to uh, thank all of you for joining us. And I think if we flip to the last slide, you'll see that there's an opportunity to um, subscribe to our national national newsletter if you would like more information. And again, thank you for joining us and wishing you all a great and happy and safe day. Thanks again. Thanks everybody.